Next on stage, the future of entertainment, new platforms, new formats, and new audiences. Please welcome Sari Feinberg, Senior Vice President, Marketing and Content Partnerships, NBC Universal Advertising and Partnerships, Abay Singal, co-founder in Moby, and Steven Lepetak, Europe, Europe, Europe Bureau Chief Adweek. Okay, future of entertainment. There's a small topic, eh? Where are we going to go with this? So, um, where we are in the world right now is there has never been so much content out there. You even walk up and down the Quizette, it is just content-tastic, people making it constantly. And we've had the streaming wars, now we're in the war for attention. It's everyone's fighting to try and get audience. So what we're going to talk about is exactly that, with, with two people who have different... Well, you'll we'll have similar perspectives, but come from different backgrounds in how you're serving the war for attention. Uh, what I'll do is I'll ask each of you to introduce yourself first of all, and then we're just going to smash through this. Okay, so, Sari, please. Hi, everybody. I am Sari Feinberg. I am from NBC Universal and the marketing and content team. Hi, I'm Abhay Singhal. I'm the same guy in that picture. I don't have the facial hair, but. Uh, uh, I'm co-founder and CEO of Inmobi and Glance, and we're trying to make a world a better place by building a better discovery platform uh, for the content on mobile. So media technology, we have a lot to explore here about where things are going, but also obviously what are the solutions for advertisers and how advertisers and partners are benefiting from all this. But uh, to geek out, first of all, so NBCU has a massive year ahead. Um, it's got Saturday Night Live's 50th anniversary, the Olympics is coming up, there's so much coming. Um, can you talk a bit about what we can expect from you guys uh, over the next 12 months? Absolutely. So we are here uh, celebrating two very big events, the Paris Olympics next year and SNL 50, which will kick off in the Paris Olympics next summer with some, uh, some talent joining the athletes in Paris, not too far from here. We have a seven month long celebration starting in the Olympics that will take us through a big blowout anniversary weekend right. in the first quarter of 2025. We're going to have live events. Uh -huh. We are going to have a very big concert and comedy show at Radio City, also with performances from SNL talent as they do musical acts that they had done previously. We are going to have a 50th anniversary special where stars from past and present come and join us in the famed Studio 8H. And then we're going to have a ton of original content throughout the season, so regular season episodes. Right. And then we're also going to have retrospectives, documentary series that's really essentially a love letter to SNL and what it has, the impact that it has had on culture. Uh -huh and lots more in store. It's really coming together very nicely. And it's interesting to talk about the future of entertainment when it's one of the biggest entertainment brands and looking back in the last 50 years. F from all the, from everything you're developing right now and with advertisers in mind, what do you think is particularly innovative that you're creating right now that's new that you haven't done before for this celebration? So I think the key to SNL 50 that's really interesting is this has been a show and a beloved IP for 50 years and for the first time ever really opening the doors to our partners in ways that we've never done before. Right. So I mentioned some of the content that we're going to be doing and we're going to be bringing brands along throughout the course of the celebration. So whether that's having presence on site at the events and having ex activations on the ground, we're looking at how technology can play a role. Again, we're talking about 2025 in some examples, so things will continue to emerge, but we have, we're have we bringing them along for the ride in ways that we never really have before. So there is a whole, there's technology plays coming in as well as part of this. We're working through that right And I, I take it you're using them uh, as almost a test case, this is stuff that you want to use elsewhere as well. Yeah, I think the big thing with SNL is they've always been on the cutting edge, whether that's, you know, they were the first on you, one of the first on YouTube. They did a giant AR experience, 360 video for the 40th anniversary. So we're just looking at what's new, how we can scale, how we can really bring SNL 50 to fans wherever they are across all screens and all platforms. Uh, it's so exciting. I, I can't wait to see what you do. Um, Abby, so you, you're going to uh, you, you're coming from the tech side of things, and you have a you have a definite point of view in terms of how entertainment can be accessed and how um, media uh, media and brands can engage with new audiences. It's called the surface economy, though, and can you talk a bit about what that is? What what are you, what are you developing here? 
Yeah, that's amazing. But before I talk, can you just tee up the video? We have a quick 20 second video here to play. Yeah, so this was a quick one, but one of the things that you would notice, and as a consumer behavior, before I bring mark brand and marketers into the picture, as a consumer behavior, our behavior is kind of limited into more or less five or seven apps that we access on a constant motion. And there's a lot of content being created by great publishers uh, like NBC, and I love your shows uh, that you create, but almost all of those shows are vying for consumer attention. On the other hand, when you look at consumers, consumers are kind of living in FOMO, a fear of missing out, because they are they're literally not, they, they kind of want to be in the know, but they don't know how to be able to track all these things on an ongoing basis. And we sort of married these two things together and tried to reimagine how uh, the surfaces of the device should look like, whether it is your phone surface or whether it is your TV surface or, or iPad surface, how they should look like, how you can reimagine uh, the front screen of your phone, which for most of us carries the picture of our uh, kids or dogs or loved ones, how do you sort of figure out a very small widget on top of those screens, a widget that is sort of almost always keeping you in the know of what's going on? And uh, for example, one of the big partnerships that we did is with the large Premier League uh, that is in the business of uh, conducting cricket matches, and that tells you that I'm from a cricket-loving nation. Um, but the biggest problem that they were trying to solve is users didn't know when the match is getting interesting. Because most of the time, users are actually watching the matches when they are becoming interesting. They no longer want to watch the match in totality. And we worked with them to bring, bring a very unique 10-second uh, clips of the game to tell that the game is beginning to get interesting and you should come and then watch it. And we saw that the consumption of the game actually went up 10x when you were able to tell the user at the right moment in time that this is the time for you to watch. So there is a lot of technology and AI that is going behind to make it possible. But to a consumer, it is very simple. To a consumer, we want to be bringing you the right information when you think it is relevant for you, right. and then off you go. We don't want you to keep, keep with us. We want you to go and do what you really enjoy, but, but know that right on your surface as, as, you are, uh, as you're going through your day. So, so can you explain, are they, are they like, are they alerts? What is it the consumer sees exactly? What? Yeah, it's interesting. It's actually not an app. Uh, you know, we've done partnership with almost every uh, phone manufacturer uh, on Android, uh, in including with Android, that we've done the partnership. And this actually comes as a feature on the phone itself. It's actually not yet another app. We're not trying to take the attention away from the app developers and publishers who, who are ultimately managing the consumer experience. Um, and with the user consent, we are actually totally taking over or changing their screen uh, uh, to their liking. And the testament of our success is that uh, we have 95% of the users that consent keep the same screen even after 60 days. Um, we're not yet live in the US. I mean, we're doing some testing in the US with about 10 million devices uh, in the US. But in Asia, where we are very, very huge, we're running with almost 260 million phones um, where users are you know, generating over uh, 100 times a day, they're generating the traffic from the surface to the relevant apps inside. Right. So it's a completely new paradigm. It's a paradigm that I don't think anyone can imagine as of yet. Uh, Apple is trying to do something with their own widgets, which they had launched in the new operating system. Uh, but I believe that we're gonna we're gonna do better than that. And so, where where do advertisers come into all this then? Is it? I mean, there are many opportunities for advertisers. I mean, including developers themselves. Like, look at look at what's happening in the industry. I mean, everyone is vying for consumer attention. Mm -hmm. um, if I was to go to a developer and if I was go to Sari and if I were to tell her that, look, let me let me increase the viewership of your live show or the match by you know X percentage point. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of economic value that she knows. Uh, to, to, to that behavior. So what we are trying to do is globally, we are trying to establish the user behavior first, right. where the users are feeling very comfortable with um, 
receiving the information and then going into the developer uh, uh, environment. Um, and then we know that we will make money. I mean, that's, that's, that's probably the easiest of the things to do. But I think making it relevant for the consumers and consumers liking is something that we are on at, the, at this moment. Uh, can I just say we're not getting danger money up here, but I feel like we should. It's getting very windy. Um, <laughs> So talking about technology then in terms of distribution or audience finding, I mean, you must have preferences as a business. What is it you see that's coming through that you guys go towards in terms of trying to get more audience to come to your shows? And from your point of view, what do you think it is that, what technology do you think is working for media companies as well, Sorry. So I think the first thing is we have content across all platforms. We have linear, digital, streaming, social, and it is our goal to reach our fans wherever they are. And we reach a, about a billion consumers every month across these platforms. And you know, I think a great example of how we're using all screens is BravoCon. So BravoCon, I don't know if you have any Bravo fans in the audience. Um, BravoCon really started out as a fan event. Right. And we have turned it into a true multi-platform, multi-screen experience. So we have this on the ground event and we capture content from there for people who can't be there for streaming. We had several panels that we streamed last year. We had over 300 pieces of digital and social content that we created from the weekend. We create content for those at home on linear. And then you know we're really bringing brands into the fold every step of the way across all of those platforms. And just a small plug, we are taking BravoCon to Vegas this November for the first time. Of course you are. It has to be <laughs> The spiciest BravoCon oh, yet. Boy. So and, uh, in terms of what, what are the platforms that you're seeing that interest you as well that media companies are using? I mean, as, as she said, media companies are wherever the fans are. I mean, right. they, are, they are in the business of making, uh, reaching the closest to the fans uh, in, in, in every which way, uh -huh. whether emotionally or you know, physically, as, as she was saying about Vegas, or, or, or in terms of the screen. And, and we believe that um, uh, the first screen of your phone is the closest screen uh, that the consumers are seeing. Uh, they're seeing that almost 100 to 170, 80 times a day. Um, how many of us are, you know, going to any one particular app that many times a day? I mean, for a typical good developer, your your daily active user to monthly active user ratio is less than six, seven percent, and and that too makes like billions and billions of dollars of business. So I believe that the closest real estate to the consumer is this is their front screens, and if we are able to develop a behavior where consumers like what they are seeing and if the consumers are able to um, get entertained by what they're seeing and if it is reducing their uh, anxiety and FOMO, I think we would have achieved a very great purpose. In fact, there is one interesting study that we saw and we were not out there to do it, but this is, this is sometimes good outcomes count, come out of what you're trying to do. Um, the, the phones where there is glance on the lock screen were actually seeing users use less time on m addictive apps. Right. And it's very interesting to see because more often than not, if you realize your behavior, certainly mine, we go into those apps more as a habit, whether it's a TikTok or an Instagram and something. And when we are into those apps, we'll spend next 15, 20 minutes and we'll look back and be like, what did we do in those minutes? Why did I do, why did I even open that TikTok? Like I, I personally deleted my TikTok app probably six times and I always install it back. Why? I, I don't know that. I'm, that's, FOMO. That's, that's, FOMO. The, that's the FOMO. Right. So if you, if you want to give that hit uh, to the consumer, if you want to satisfy that FOMO anxiety of the consumer, just show them one single piece of content and let it be. Let, let them not be addicted by it and, and they are out of it because they're going to come to me and see my screen 200 times a day anyway. I don't need to hog their attention and keep it back every time. So I feel that we're doing something, something amazing. If, if we are able to get successful in our mission, we would hopefully be able to even remove some bit of this addiction that we all have to our own devices and make, make it a little bit of a better place. So as a segue, mention TikTok, so we can go into creators and influencers. And what I love about, especially uh, NBCU's content is, you've landed in such a sweet place in terms of the shows you produce, there's so much that just works with the influencer space that we're in. How, how are you tapping into that? So I think there's two, there's two pieces. So I think 
we have hundreds and hundreds of our own talent that we can work with as influencers, in particular for brands. So they obviously have the show followings, their own personal followings. We use talent for brands all the time. And I'm gonna do a little Bravo again because oh. I can't help it. We this, just did this, this right? incredible case study. We did a partnership with Uber One and we worked with three of the talent from Vanderpump Rules. You know, lightning in a bottle right now. A huge scandal around the show. I don't know about everybody else. My social feed was just flooded with, and from the news, right? Like White House Correspondents' Dinner to CNN to, you know, the Bravoholic blogger. Like all I got pushed out to me was about Bravo. So we used these three women um, and we recreated a song of one of the talents, Sheena Shea. Uh, using words that were important to Uber. So we essentially did a remix of a song that she had put out with these three women. And not only was it fun and catchy, it went viral. I mean, we had all of these influencers on their own, like Charlie DeMillo, like did a, a TikTok to this song. So we were able to push it out to Uber's target audience, but we also just got so much organic play for this. And then we also work with creators. Um, we have a program called Creator Accelerator that we are invested in, and we are working with creators who have millions and millions of followers across all of the social platforms to kind of bring more scale and different diverse and authentic voices right. to our partner content. I have not Absolutely. seen, I need to see that Uber campaign, that's, that's clever. Um, I really want to talk to you about the potential of virtual influencers and what AI can do to heighten that. What, what, do you have a view on that? Oh, absolutely. And I think, uh, and you know, we're learning, we're learning a lot of that from, from Asia where I think virtual influencers and virtual avatars uh, are part of, uh, part of social cycle mm -hmm. almost at all points in time. Um, and we're trying to see that because, you know, certainly what AI is able to do, it's actually able to even free up the influencers to create probably more digital avatars of themselves. Avatars that are able to uh, be more relevant to the brands, avatars that are available, you know, at all points in time in different settings who do not need to be physically present in those places. So, so I, I fundamentally think that the future of influencing is going to be deep rooted in authenticity, uh -huh. but also in some sort of uh, virtuality, because you're able to probably take it to places where you are otherwise not able to take. In fact, one of the things that we did with Glance for, for, for a couple of uh, our developer partners, uh, we're, we took all of their uh, sort of original content that we've created and we recreated a bunch of that content uh, using, using the AI. And they were shocked at seeing it. They were shocked at seeing that the that the performance of the content that is actually being created by the AI was actually three to four times higher than the content that was being created by some of the best creative minds. So it may be early days of what's going on, but if that's even a little bit true, I think we're gonna see an explosion of content that we have not seen before. Um, and we all should be very careful where that content is coming from, who owns the IP of that content, and so on and so forth. So all of those big hairy problem still needs to be addressed. Uh -huh. But it is, it is for, for, for a fact it is true that consumers are liking what they are seeing. Right. And they are, they are paying it with their eyeballs and their seconds and their days uh, spending time on these sort of content. Right. It does feel as though, yeah, I can see that happening, but it just, it's mind blowing. And the fact that we're getting closer to it. Um, so from, I, I want to get us off this stage as quick as soon as I can because I can see us flying soon. So from both of your perspectives then, can, can I ask you what is it that excites you about where entertainment is going? Is there one thing that in particular you're like, yes, I can't wait to get there? I think for me, we are doing great in the commerce enabled space, so uh, commerce enabled content space. It's a big priority for our company. Um, I just can't wait to do more of that. I, I don't know about you guys, I love shopping from basically all screens. So looking at my phone, it's just amazing. I can't wait to see the day when, you know, we just click and shop with our remotes, you know, off of our favorite celebrities. I think that's like the holy grail and, and we're close to getting there. And uh, again, though, you guys are perfectly set to do something like that with, with all your stars. Are you tapping that already or thinking about it? it? Yes, it is something that we have in the works. I think, you know, you say stars. I think, you know, those are conversations we have. We're fortunate in that 
we have content across a lot of different genres. So we have the ability to work with different types of individuals. So like in that space, we're look, thinking more about the reality, competition reality space. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's very interesting that you say that. I mean, and um, you know, hopefully next year we'll, we'll show you a model of how we are bringing all of that content discovery on the TV screens as well. Because uh, again, TV screen is one of the biggest screen in our living room that does nothing. I mean, it's, it's as less interactive as it can be right now. But just to take the uh, point of view forward about the commerce, uh, this serendipitous shopping or shop attainment, as we call it, is the, is, the, is the coolest, newest thing that is going on. And I think that's a huge opportunity for brands to integrate because consumers, uh, they, they love what they see. And if they love what they see, they want to buy it. And they want to buy it in as less friction as possible. So if you're able to remove this whole friction of, oh, I need to open an app, and I need to pull my wallet out, and I need to do this, I need to search it, I think that all is going to change and change significantly. And that's what younger audiences are looking for, surely, just less stages to actually access content. Um, how are you guys thinking about that in terms of younger audiences and the experiences you put out? In general, I think, again, you know, when you look at the vast array of content that we have across the portfolio, I think we target all different communities. And I think it's really interesting to see how different demographics consume the same content based on the platform that it's on. So if you look at The Tonight Show, the audience looks quite different from linear television to the clips on YouTube to the people that are consuming content on social. So I think, again, we're just making sure that whatever we make, we're creating right content for right platform at the right time, but also keeping those audiences in mind to make sure that we could deliver the full spectrum. Yeah, and to come back to, in fact, should we finish on this because uh, oh, it's lunchtime? Um, to come back to SNL, they have, I mean, that is a show that has really used YouTube and the clips and really built itself and almost probably found a whole new generation using YouTube brilliantly. That's exactly right. And I think, again, you know, in, in talking with the team, it's like they know their audiences on each platform and they know that someone who is looking at and Instagram Reels or looking at TikTok or looking at Facebook want all different things. And they're really trying to speak to that multi-generational audience wherever they are in the right way and creating for platform. Uh, I'm not going to take questions simply because I want off stage. But if uh, you have questions, the guys will be around for a few minutes. Come say hello. Come say hello. We're here to socialize, so do that. But thank you both for talking to me. I, I've learned a hell of a lot and I've actually got a lot to follow up on as well. So we'll do this next year, okay? Same time, same place. I'll yeah. see you here. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Thank you guys.